Thanks, Melissa. Thank you all for, for sharing your lunch with me. Uh, it's, it's a real treat to be here. Vermont Law School has been the gold standard uh, in environmental law for many years, uh, and it's a real delight to be part of the community uh, for two weeks. So thank you all for being, for being so hospitable. Um, what I'm, as, as Melissa said, I'm going to talk with you today about a book that I wrote um, on, on the history of drinking water, and I want to start off with a story. Uh, so the story takes place in a city in the highlands of the Andes called Cochabamba. Uh, and like many cities in developing countries, uh, access to treated water is a real issue, right? So almost half the population does not have access to water infrastructure. And as a result, you've got this tragic situation where the very poorest actually pay the most uh, for their money. Uh, and this has been known, uh, this problem has been known for a long time. Uh, and the way it was addressed in the late 80s and 90s was through a program called Structural Adjustment. And the World Bank and International Monetary Fund essentially pushed this, this strategy that the way to improve provision of services, not just drinking water, a whole range, a whole range of services, was essentially to bring in more of the private sector. And the arguments, you're all familiar with the arguments, greater access to capital, they're more efficient, they care more about customers. And so the, uh, the region uh, around Cochabamba put out a tender for a 40-year license, essentially to provide, uh, to take over the, the provision of, of drinking water um, and, and wastewater. Uh, and while they were doing this, the National Parliament, National Assembly uh, for Bolivia, passed a law that forbade the private collection of water. This was happening at the same time. There's a lot of dispute about what happened uh, once this group called Aguas del Tunar, which, which really was that hill. Uh, and some local partners took over. Prices clearly went up. How much they went up is, is a subject of debate. What's not a subject of debate uh, is the riots that followed. Uh, there were riots throughout the region. A number of people were killed. Uh, and within three months, the, um, the government had canceled the contract with Aguas del Tunari and basically kicked them out and taken over, taken over the service uh, again. While this was going on, a group of grassroots organizations got together and they published something they called the Cochabamba Declaration. Now, you can read this for yourself, but the main point that comes across here uh, is twofold. The first is that access to water, and when they say water here, they mean drinking water. Access to drinking water should be regarded as a human right, uh, and moreover, it should not be regarded as a commodity, something that's mediated by markets. And what's interesting is if you contrast this with the results of the declaration of an international governmental conference that had taken place six years, six years earlier in Dublin, they published something called the Dublin Declaration. And this is the view of the world's governments. Uh, and as you can see, it's saying the exact opposite. It's saying that water fundamentally should be regarded as a commodity, should be regarded as an economic good. And this was sort of, the, the, this sort of chasm, that this, the two sort of different conceptions of water, is one of the things that got me interested in this topic in the first place. And I wondered uh, how it was that a pretty uh, little known city uh, in Bolivia became, at least for the anti-globalization movement, the equivalent of the storming of the Bastille. Right? If you follow the anti-globalization movement, Cochabamba has real meaning. Right? It, and, and so I was interested in this, and so I started looking into it. And my goal in writing this book, I told friends I wanted to write an airport book. Right? So I've, I've written, as Melissa said, a fair number of case books. And that's fine, uh, and they've sold fine. But the fact is, students are required to buy case books. It's a good business model. Um, but it doesn't do much of the ego, right? So I wanted to write a book where essentially if you were delayed for a few hours, you walked into the airport bookstore and instead of buying crap like Freakonomics or 1L, you would buy my book. Uh, that was sort of the overall, the overall goal. And essentially it's this model on college. You're basically trying to give all these different aspects um, of drinking water. It's sort of as, a, as something that deserves a history, history of its own. So what I'm going to talk about with you today is who gets to drink. Uh, is it safe to drink the water? Uh, and this need versus truth, sort of, um, sort of sprinkling of, um, of different topics. So when I, when I was trying to figure out sort of how to think about the, the Cochabamba conflict, I asked myself, first of all, how far back does this conflict go between whether drinking water should be thought of primarily as a commodity or primarily as a human right? And I went back as far as I could go. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at ancient archaeological excavations, uh, a few things are, 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 are evident. The first is you always find very sophisticated technology for that era in terms of how the water is stored and provided. Uh, and that makes sense, right? You can't have a settled society unless you can ensure uh, safe drinking water. So on the right here, you've got Machu Picchu, right? very high in the Andes, very sophisticated water system. Uh, on the left, you've got uh, Masada, right? This cistern is basically carved into the rock in the driest place on Earth. Anyone know where this is? 
right? This is underneath Istanbul, Constantinople, right? Huge cisterns uh, underneath, uh, underneath that city. Uh, this is the oldest example we have of storage of drinking water. This is called a kanat, and this is in Jordan. This is about 3,500 years old. So you've got engineering, obviously, but also because it's a scarce resource, there are going to be rules, right? Because not everyone's going to get access to a scarce resource, so how do you decide who gets access, who doesn't? And I looked to the Bible, the Torah, which is, as you know, is full, full of laws, full of rules. And it turns out that there are rules about drinking water as well. And what you find out is that drinking water is not treated as a marketed good at all. In fact, if you sell drinking water, it's seen actually as sacrilege because it's a gift. It's a gift from God. However, if there's human labor involved in, in actually getting access to the water, for instance, if you dig a well, then you can exclude outsiders. It's a communal property resource. But that's subject to something called the right of thirst. And the right of thirst basically uh, is an exception. It's, it, those of you who know uh, the sort of Rawlsian, Rawlsian rules, the idea of what kind of rule would you want universally uh, for fairness, this is one of those examples. And it says that if someone from outside your community is in desperate need of drinking water, they get priority. And it makes sense, because if you're out there in the desert and you need water, you know, it could be you who takes advantage of this, um, of this rule. Uh, and it turns out that uh, you find this, this type of, of legal structure in a lot of different places. So you look at Islamic water law, very similar. In fact, the word for Islamic water law, Sharia, actually literally means the way to water, which again is what you might expect in a water scarce, water scarce area. And again, you can read, you can read this yourself, but essentially this is talking about, this is from the Quran, that says basically sharing water, this idea of the right of thirst uh, is, a holy, is a holy act uh, as well. Uh, you find this, this, this system in a number of other places too, with, with, some, with some interesting twists. So in India, traditional Hindu India, uh, because of the caste system, there's a notion that water can not only be physically polluted, but can be metaphysically polluted as well. And so different castes have their own sources of drinking water. But even then, there's a right of thirst if there's, um, if there's dire need. Unless we sort of talk about how you know, crazy it is to have this idea of sort of non-physical or, or, or spiritual pollution, but we had much the same thing in the United States for much of our history, right? The history of drinking fountains, the history of access to water is very much a history of sort of non-physical or, or, or um, metaphysical pollution as well. This photo is taken uh, from the county courthouse uh, in Granville, North Carolina. And obviously there are a lot of, a lot of examples of that. Uh, now, what I did, I looked around to as many indigenous societies as I could find. They all have a right of thirst, uh, which is actually kind of a global, a global idea in indigenous uh, indigenous cultures, uh, and there are a few things that come out when you, when you look into this. Uh, the first is that if you go way, way back, uh, water was thought of as a right, not as a commodity. Um, the second uh, is that this is a very, very robust system, right? This still endures in many places around the world today. So the question is, when was the transition of drinking water from a human right to a commodity? And the answer, really for all things water, is wrong. Right, the Romans were the first great kind of water, sort of hydraulic, hydraulic society. Uh, and there are a few things about it that are worth noting. The first is, uh, this engineering is still intact 2,000 years later. It's also beautiful, right? They really, the Romans really understood, understood how to deal uh, with water. Any of you who have traveled to Italy know that there are fountains everywhere, right? Very much the sort of Italian, uh, Italian culture. Uh, and so, as you also know, Rome got most of its water from aqueducts. Interestingly, uh, the water was not brought in originally for drinking. It was brought in originally <coughs> for the great, Roman, the great Roman insight, which was not to bring water into the city, but to get waste out of the city. Uh, and so the water was used to basically flush waste out of what they call the cloaca maxima, the first sewer system uh, in the world. Uh, later on, you get uh, aqueducts bring, bring uh, clean water in. And the access initially was a human right access. And the way you got your water was through something called a locus. And so this is the lock that's right here. It essentially uh, was free flowing, gravity flowing, and it was basically equivalent of an urban well. So this is a photo from Pompeii, and you can see a lock that's right here, uh, and up there, the other marble, about every 100, 200, uh, 200 yards, there was this, this lock. And so the only thing that basically restricted how much water you could take was how much you could carry. But here's where things start to get interesting. So it turns out there was also water as a marketed good in ancient Rome. Um, and the way it worked, so the Marcia Aqueduct, almost half of, of the water that brought in was for sale. And the way it worked was you paid to essentially pipe your water from the main into your house. 
And because there was no faucet, it was simply gravity flowing, the, so the, the amount that you paid was a tax called a vectical, and was based on the diameter of the water pipe. Bigger water pipe, you pay more. Uh, how do we know this is a big deal? Well, for one thing, most Roman senators had um, uh, paid the vectical. The other thing, I, I should just do an aside, uh, one of the fascinating things I found doing this, this project was that you know enormous amounts of certain aspects of Roman society for pure happenstance. So there's a Roman engineer, his name was Fr Frontinus, and he wrote a treaty on, on water engineering. And it, it survived through monasteries or whatever. So it, it, it's basically like if some, I don't know, like a Home Depot manual on plumbing survived 2,000 years. So future archaeologists know enormous amounts about our plumbing, but not much else about other things. We know a lot about the water system in Rome. Um, and Frontinus complains about something he called puncturing. So puncturing was a crime. And what puncturing was is late at night, these people, are probably the servants, would climb out into the street, pick up the flagstones, and puncture the mains. Uh, and it was, it was gravity fed, so there wasn't a lot of water pressure. And then basically run the pipe into their own house. Why could they do this? Well, the, 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 the pipe was made out of plumbum, which is Latin for lead, so it's a fairly soft metal. Uh, and this was such a problem, they had a fine of 100,000 sesterces. Uh, Google Exchange is not helping uh, <laughs> on this, but 100,000 the most anything, except maybe Lyra, uh, is, worth, uh, is worth a lot of money. And this puncturing continues today. So this is a picture from Lagos, Nigeria. Here they are puncturing electricity, right? Don't, don't do this at home, right? But it's a common, it, it's a common phenomenon. And so you have this actually quite sophisticated uh, financing strategy where the vectical would pay for upkeep. Uh, the imperial treasury would pay, and these sort of individual donations would pay for um, the infrastructure. And so what you've got is cross-subsidization. So what's interesting is depending on how you're getting your water, the, the, the nature of drinking water has fundamentally different conceptions. If you're getting your water from the vectical, you get it by right. I'm sorry, if you're getting it by the, by the locus, you're getting it by right. If you're getting it from the vectical, it's a marketed good. Right? And so the nature of water depends fundamentally on how you're getting it. But there's a political aspect as well. So for those of you who know your Roman history, Augustus was the first Roman dictator. He took over after Julius Caesar was killed. And one of the very first things he did was dramatically increase the number of locus and make them much more ornate. Uh, and this is actually a play right out of the playbook of totalitarian dictatorships, right? So what do you see with Stalin and Castro and North Korea? These massive public works projects with the dictator's face all over them. And Augustus was doing the same thing. He was saying, you're getting your water thanks to me, right? Aqua nomine Caesaris, water in the name of your ruler. Okay, so we sort of start to see a transition then from water as a human right to water is both a right and a marketed good. Then the question becomes, when does it become truly a marketed good? And for that, again, we're gonna to turn to where everything is for sale. Um, actually, before I get there, uh, one sort of quick thing. Um, so, uh, so the question then is, so you've got sort of the Romans, then you've got the Dark Ages, right? You basically got a um, period where the Roman technology and learning is lost for a long time. And so the strategy essentially in Europe over that time is if you can, if you can avoid drinking water, that's what you do. This is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful book that, that helped me in writing my book, um, where basically it says the pilgrims, this is talking about the pilgrims, they disliked, distrust, and despised drinking water. You may not know this, but one of the very first buildings the pilgrims built when they actually landed in Plymouth was a brewery. Uh, it wasn't because they were having keg parties uh, mm -hmm. on Saturday, it's because that was a safer, safer liquid to, um, to drink. Um, so where do you start to see water as a marketing good? That's New York. Right? You know the story of the sale of Manhattan Island to, to the Dutch. Um, and one of the very first things the Dutch did was they built a fort, right? And the well, this actually, this is kind of for a silly, a silly issue, uh, a silly magazine. Um, you can imagine this, you know, the history of civic services, water supplies number one. You wait for what number two was going to be, right? Sort of uh, sewage or something. <laughs> um, but it's accurate. The well was outside the fort, and the initial settlers in New Amsterdam uh, they collected rainwater, and they got their water from a shallow pond that was called the Calhoun, later became the Collect under the English. It's around 32nd Broadway, for those of you who know New York City. Um, but they want the, uh, the, 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 the private settlement, they want the, the East India Company to build more wells for them. Peter Stuyvesant says it's not charity, it's a company, you know, go, go suit yourself. Um, and that's fine until the British come sailing up the Hudson. So the Dutch run into their fort, uh, they close the gate, they turn around and realize they have no water inside the fort. They open the gate, 
uh, and they surrender because they can't withstand the siege. So one of the very first things the British do, other than changing the name of New Amsterdam to New York, is they build some public wells. But they don't build a lot, right? And so basically, uh, the people continue to rely mostly for water on the collect, which by the mid-18th century is a real problem because New York has really become urbanized. And so this is uh, a uh, uh, quote from one of the newspapers at the time. They called the collect the very sink and common sewer. God help Peter Kalm. He is a Swedish botanist who writes a travelogue uh, of his voyages around, around, it was not the United States then, it was the British colonies, in 1746, and he's got a line that Rodney Dangerfield would have loved. He says, the drinking water in New York is so bad that horses from out of town refuse to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a problem. And the, the New Yorkers realize this. Um, and so what you get is a purely private response, something called the tea water trade. These basically are deep wells that are, that are dug in, around Manhattan, and they basically fill these barrels every day, and they go up and down the streets of New York selling what was called tea water. And it was, it was good drinking water. And that's fine unless you're poor uh, or you're trying to fight a fire. Right? So this doesn't really work very well for the real needs of the city. And so they actually go ahead, and the city in 1774 actually issues money uh, based on a, a sort of bond issue, first money issued by an American city. Um, and they're going to have this incredibly complicated system of aqueducts and pumps and stuff around the city. The timing is not good. Right? They start building in New York as one of the very first cities occupied by the British in the Revolutionary War. And one of the first things they do is to destroy all the waterworks. The war ends, uh, and Baltimore and Boston and Philadelphia all put in these, these municipal water systems. New York doesn't. Um, and at this point, uh, a purely pro another purely private uh, uh, proposal comes in, and this one is just a weird, a weird story. So uh, Aaron Burr, who's a gentleman with the glasses, and Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill, um, they join together, and yes, it's the same Aaron Burr who shot and killed Alexander Hamilton several years later. This is country did not go well. Um, and Burr goes up to Albany, and he persuades the state assembly to give this Manhattan company a monopoly on the provision of, quote, pure and wholesome water. And the idea is that they're going to pipe in water from the Bronx River, uh, which at that point is still clean. Uh, and they're given the authority to raise $2 million in order to, to do this. The problem is that Burr was a scoundrel, and he had no intention of spending any money or, or any, any real money in order to get the water. So what Burr does, as soon as the Manhattan Company gets its charter, is he basically puts a pipe in to collect, and he takes the rest of the $2 million, and he loans it. So what Burr's game was, was he wanted basically the authority to raise money and lend it without the strictures of a bank charter, which is what he does. In Manhattan Company, they, they use the monopoly to drive the tea water pumps out of business, um, and they, uh, they sort of basically become a bank uh, for all intents and purposes, and about 30 years later, they draw up the sham and become the Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, and this is actually where the Chase Manhattan Bank came from. It's true, everything else I've, I've made up, but this is true. <laughs> and if you look at the logo, the logo of Chase Manhattan Bank is the cross-section of a wooden water pipe. Uh, and they continued to pump water into the 1920s because they were afraid they would lose their corporate charter. Uh, so it's the only bank formed on, formed on drinking water. Um, obviously, this is a disaster, right? So in, you know, in the early 1800s, all the other competitive cities on the East Coast and Eastern Seaboard have these sophisticated municipal water systems, and New York is still relying on the collect, uh, which Peter Kalm, you know, seven years earlier, had said was, was so awful. Uh, there are cholera outbreaks, there are fires. Uh, eventually, the state steps in, uh, and they build this big reservoir in Croton that some of you from New York may know about, and they, they pipe water in. Um, and that's really the end of sort of purely private provision uh, in New York City. And, but even here, you get a very interesting variant in the right of thirst. So it turns out that um, for about 20 years after Croton, uh, Croton water was piped in, you could still get water for free in New York from the hydrants. They were called um, Croton Street hydrants. Uh, there wasn't the kind of water pressure that, that we have today. Um, eventually, that becomes unnecessary because water becomes commonplace in buildings, not for drinking water, but for this newfangled invention called the water closet, uh, which again is kind of the Roman from an insight into the importance of getting, of getting sewage out of the city. So uh, I could have told you similar histories about how basically public provision takes over private provision in other, in other cities, and this sort of addresses the issue of sort of historically who gets to drink, but there's an allied question as well, and the question is, is the water safe to drink? It's one thing to bring in water and to give it to people, it's another for you not to get sick 
sick drinking it. And one of the sort of intellectually most difficult questions I was wrestling with in writing this book is how you even think about safe drinking water, right? Because if we were to step into a time capsule and go back 150 years, we would be wise not to drink the water. That said, people from that era thought it was perfectly safe, right? So what is safe, what does safe water even mean? And it turns, it, it depends, I think, uh, on what your conception of disease is. So there's basically ideas have changed throughout time, the sort of four humors, or the sort of ancient classical idea. Uh, in Europe, really until about the mid to late 19th century, until the sort of germ theory became, became prominent, uh, there was something called the miasmatic theory. And the idea was that you got sick from drinking poison air, bad air. So think about malaria, right? Malaria literally means bad air. Uh, and there was something to that, right? There, the air was putrid around, around disease. Um, and so the question is sort of how did, how did this shift take place? And there's a central character, and some of you may know this story, but this guy, so the, 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 he's central to the history of drinking water. His name is John Snow. He was a self-made Yorkshireman um, who became one of the, prom, one of the premier uh, physicians of his era. Uh, he was the very first person to use anesthesia for childbirth. He actually delivered Queen Victoria's last child uh, under anesthesia. You can imagine what had happened if that had gone, if that had gone wrong, but it, it went fine. Uh, he was convinced that cholera, which was the huge scourge in that era, he was convinced it was a waterborne disease, but he couldn't prove it. And in fact, there was an editorial in The Lancet, which was, and still is, sort of the premier medical journals in the world. 1832, it basically denounces snow as a quack uh, for arguing that water, uh, that cholera is waterborne. Uh, about 10 years ago, they published a retraction. <laughs> um, so Snow was trying to figure out how to demonstrate that cholera was waterborne, and he seized on an outbreak of cholera that happened um, in an area of London called Soho in 1854. And what he realized was that a law had been passed by Parliament about 10 years earlier that required you to keep records of people who had died. Before that, it had been very much like Monty Python's bring out your life, right? If you died, you just disappeared, right? So Snow went to the records office, and he charted where everyone lived who had died during a cholera epidemic, and he produced something that's become known as a ghost map. And essentially, what you can see from each of these black bars is where someone lived who had died from the cholera epidemic. And it all circles around this black circle you can see in the middle of Broad Street called pump, that's a pump. It was a Broad Street pump in the middle of Soho. And Snow thought he finally had the evidence he needed, but there was a problem. And the problem was that two people had died of cholera at the same time. One lived seven miles away, and one lived 11 miles away. So it was a waterborne, how could that, how could that be? That sounds more like airborne. But he was a very fastidious researcher, and so he goes to visit the, 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 uh, the son of the woman who's just died seven miles away and is offering some commiserations, and the guy says, yeah, you know, she used to live in Soho, and she so loved the water that she would send her servant to the pump once a week to bring water. And Snow goes, interesting, anything else? happened recently, uh, and he says, yes, my poor aunt, she died of cholera too, she had just been here a week ago to visit. Uh, and Snow sort of has his evidence, he goes, to the, he goes to the council and they shut down the pump. The pump. And this is the origin of epidemiology. And in fact, uh, until recently, the, the SEAL, or the Society, International Society of Epidemiology, was a pump handle. This is where it all, where it all starts from. Um, so that's sort of what was going on uh, in Europe. The germ theory, Koch, Pester, Lister, starts to take hold in the late 19th century, and the challenge of the United States, because in the US there was a lot of access to drinking water, but the idea basically was you had a, a cup that was attached by a chain to the faucet. And so how do you get people, if, if you believe the germ theory, this is not a good idea. And so this actually is a pamphlet that was produced by the Minnesota State Board of Health. Right? And the message is pretty clear, right? Don't do this, right? this is a bad idea. Um, there was even uh, a, 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 an early NGO that was created. They, they had something called uh, the Cup Campaign, which was their, their journal, right? The public drinking cup must go. And the message here is pretty clear, too. You know, my pretty, if you want to join me in hell, have a little sip. Um, and so what's the solution to this, right? We want to get rid of these chain cups. Well, eventually the solution was the drinking fountain, right? Which actually was known as the bubble, because initially it just came out as a bubble. But this isn't patented until 1911. So what happens before then? Well, there's this market need for a disposable, low-cost cup. And what is that? It's the Dixie cup. All right, so this is how the Dixie cup finds a market. Basically, they, 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 they realize that we've got, we've got to get rid of the chain cups. This is the patent diagram for the Dixie cup. So um, 
the, uh, the, the reason we started getting much safe drinking water, of course, was because of drinking water treatment. And so the evolution of that, very briefly, was sort of, sort of sand filters, um, a lot of opposition to sand filters in the U.S. The head of, of, of water supply in Pittsburgh thought that filtering the water at all would suggest there's something wrong with it. Um, you get the first uh, chlorination, which really changes things because uh, cholera, typhoid, other waterborne diseases are very sensitive to, um, to chlorine. Starts in Belgium and goes into Scotland. Um, the first chlorination in the U.S. is, believe it or not, East Jersey City. Right? Who knew? Uh, and it's a private company. Um, and instead, they, they have a contract to provide pure and wholesome water. And instead of using a sand filter, which is what the city thought they would use, they use chlorination and they're sued. Right? That sounds more like Jersey. Uh, and the, the, the judge, in a very pressing decision, basically holds for the technology and says, no, 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 this is satisfied the contract. And a very far-sighted New York, New York Times reporter basically says, you know, this is amazing. Uh, any municipal water plant in my power water can be made as pure as mountain spring water. Uh, this probably sounds to you a bit like the ads you get for bottled water. And the thing to realize is that around this time, tap water was as cool then as bottled water is today. Right? This is this remarkable shift, and I, I can talk more about that later, but this, it, it's, it's an important shift in time because the bottled water, water market actually collapsed at the time as a result of this. And there was a lot of opposition to chlorination of water. Right? This is someone writing uh, in 1918. Again, this notion that horses refuse to drink it, that seems to be a recurring theme when people write about, write about drinking water. So how do we get chlorinated water in the U.S.? Um, well, it turns out that it was the federal government, but through the back door. So there was um, the Interstate Commerce Commission um, basically applied this, uh, these standards that were set up by the Public Health Service, and they said, if you are a common carrier, you have to provide chlorinated drinking water. So if you provide water to trains, ferries, buses, the water has to be chlorinated. And so all the big cities around the U.S., obviously they have these common carriers passing through them, that's how they chlorinate their water. Uh, and by the mid-century, mid-20th century, uh, most everywhere is, is chlorinated, but the standards are quite limited. They're only bacteriological, they're revised, but there really aren't a lot, aren't a lot of them. Um, and so there's concern about this, and sort of the rise of the environmental era, uh, there's a lot of focus on all kinds of environmental issues, and there's a study that Congress uh, orders the Public Health Service to carry out in 1970. Um, and they basically found, they looked at, uh, at, the public, at the public health standards for water in six different states, I'm sorry, five different states. Um, and the findings were shocking, right? And they, they were very clever. The head of the committee that they were reporting to was Scoop Jackson, senator from Washington. And so they focused, the, the, I've read the testimony, they focused their testimony on Washington state, which was pretty awful as well. Only 4% of the operators were certified, only seven systems out of 127 would pass the standards. And so Congress starts passing, starts drafting legislation. Uh, and the very first draft is interesting, it's called the Pure Drinking Water Act. Uh, and I don't know if that's because it was a play on the, the sort of uh, Pure Food Act, the Right Food and Cosmetic Act, it, it was kind of that, or it was the notion that they thought uh, they really wanted pure water. And it changes later, of course, to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as you know, pure and safe are very different, are very different things. Um, so a lot of debates about what should go into this law. Back and forth. It took four years before they finally they finally passed it. Um, after the 1972 election, Nixon sort of turns against environmental interests, so he's opposed to this. And finally, Gerald Ford, one of the very first acts he passes, is the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is the actual legislation that he signs, and this is the actual signing statement uh, that Gerald Ford signed. Terrible signature, right? This is his signature here. Um, anyway, he was still president. Um, so that's sort of, and, and what, what you may not know is this past December was the 40th anniversary of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, so a lot of history there as well. But of course there are questions today about whether it's, uh, drinking water is safe or not. This is from Reader's Digest um, about, uh, about three years ago. Um, you know, all kinds of challenges, right? Our, our infrastructure is falling apart. Uh, the vast majority of drinking water providers are small systems, very small um, protecting source waters, what about climate change? And what concerns a lot of people, so-called emerging contaminants. So any water you drink, whether it's from the tap or from bottled water, contains a lot of uh, anthropogenic, basically uh, synthetic compounds. All right, and that's just, that's just a fact, a lot of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we can talk about that as well. This is something we should be concerned about, not concerned about fracking, right? That's the issue du jour. Uh, with drinking water as well, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, 
as well. Um, and then just this past year, uh, it's been a bad year for drinking water, a good year for the author of a drinking water book, because uh, I've been doing a lot of NPR and, and things like that. Um, this is, uh, that's a huge out of bloom around Toledo, Ohio. They had no drink alert uh, for a week or two. This is Charleston, um, West Virginia, uh, where there was a, 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 a leak from a tank farm right above the intake for the, um, for the city drinking water supply. So it's a big issue. Uh, the fact is, though, uh, even with these problems, drinking water in the United States is remarkably safe from a historical perspective. I can go anywhere in the country, from Vermont to New Mexico, and the water I drink, I don't have to worry about. That is not the case in much of the world. Right? And so for these, those of you who are here for uh, Philip Coulet's presentation, this is kind of raising similar types of issues. If you really care about quality of life and drinking water, the developing world is where the action is. And, and Gus probably knows more about this than anyone who has worked at, um, at UNDP. The facts are, are pretty staggering. Now, obviously, these are very rough numbers, but the fact is that a large section of the world's population doesn't have access to treated water, uh, and they've got the problem the Romans recognized, their water supplies are getting contaminated by human waste. Um, and this last one, if you're an economist, I mean, half of the developing world's population is going to suffer at some point from waterborne diseases. It's huge impacts on productivity. Um, Folks know this, and so one of the main millennium development goals was increasing access to, um, to safe drinking water. And it, it's obviously hard, you know, growing up in the States to get a sense of what this means if, if you haven't traveled in the developing world. And so the way I like to describe it is to, to say, uh, take everything that you assume about drinking water and flip it on its head, right? So I don't think about quality. I can go anywhere in the country and go to the second thought to the, to the water that I drink. I don't think about quantity. In fact, I fill my swimming pool with water that I can drink. I fill my radiator with water I can drink. I feed my grass uh, with water that I can drink. Oh, and it's not my California, you will. Well, good point. I'll be fine to go to jail as a result. Um, the, um, and then the third thing is it's not my responsibility, right? There is a government or a company. I don't deal with getting water. In the develop many parts of the developing world, none of that is true. Right? So for one thing, quality is not a given at all. Um, quantity is how much you can carry generally, or how much you can, you can pay if you're buying from a water vendor. And it's an individual responsibility. Um, and it's not an individual responsibility, it's a woman's responsibility. There's a huge gender bias uh, in terms of, of, of collecting water in many developing countries. This is a part of rural India. Lots of studies on this that show that by and large, it's girls and, and, and older women who collect, who collect all this water. And if you talk to folks who work in the development field, what they'll tell you is that the, the fastest way to improve the quality of life in a village is to bring in safe drinking water. Uh, because they essentially frees up half the population for much more productive, much more productive activity. Um, and as I said, it's expensive, right? You've got to, you're not getting advantage of the economies of scale from, from infrastructure. And this has been a long-standing problem, right? Water vendors are not something new. This is a painting by Velasquez in the 17th century. Right, the idea of water vendors goes, goes way back. And so this is the reason that you had this sort of push for structural adjustment toward provision of water. Right, so I don't know if ever names these things. In the 1980s, apparently, was the International Drinking Water Decade. Um, and this is what led to the notion of the Dublin Declaration. Right? We need to bring in more capital. There's an assumption of state failure. Right? The state has not been able to provide ad adequate access to drinking water. We've got to bring in the private sector to do so. Uh, and if you invested in a number of these, these uh, global water companies a few years ago, you'd be doing quite well. Right? There's been an enormous amount of water privatization around the globe. Very controversial. And it's, you know, I've looked at this a fair amount. It's a very mixed story. There are some success stories and some disasters. Um, and privatization itself can mean a lot of different things um, in different places. Uh, but there's no question that that's been a strong, a strong trend promoted by international financial institutions. But there's been pushback. And the pushback has been, this is something you might be familiar with, is, is something called the right to water. And the central place where they focused is the UN. So it's been the ECOSOC, the Social Council, the General Assembly. Uh, and there was actually a resolution that was adopted about three years ago now uh, from the General Assembly that basically said there is a right to water. And it's a legal audience, so it's worth spending a little time looking at the text, right? So it said the human right to water, so it is a human right. It tells everyone, right, so it's universal to sufficient, such quantity, safe, quality, acceptable, social, physically accessible, and this is key, affordable, 
People who call for the human right to water are not saying it should be free. They're saying it should be affordable, but there's a tension, right? Because they also say it shouldn't primarily be an economic good. And so how do you decide if you're gonna pay for it, but it's not an economic good, how do you, how do you mediate that? And that's a, big, that's a big area of controversy right now, um, which I'm happy to talk about um, as well. And so where we find ourselves at the end of all this is a real, um, I think, conceptual, uh, conceptual fissure, right? There are different communities in, in various aspects of the world, in various, in various institutions, that have totally different conceptions of what drinking water is, right? There are groups who basically say it's a social, cultural good, it's a human right, there's no place for markets, and those who say, no, it must be regarded as a commodity, and if we don't, it's going to be overused and we're not going to get adequate, adequate investment. Um, and I think there are a few things you, that, that can sort of inform this debate if we take a historical vantage, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, and the, the few things that come out, the first is this notion of water as a human right is not a new idea. It goes back as far as we can trace. But importantly, the notion of water as a Christ resource is not a new idea either. It goes back at least till Roman times and arguably, or potentially, earlier. So the sort of rights versus markets, I think, is a false, is a false dichotomy. So, so what else can we learn from this? Um, I, I had the good fortune to take natural resources law uh, from a professor named Carol Rose, who a brilliant, brilliant woman. Um, and she basically, one of the things she emphasized in her course was if you want to understand natural resources, you got to focus on the natures of the resource. And water is a very complicated resource, right? It's a physical resource. You got to move it, and it's heavy. California, in California, roughly 20% of the electricity consumed by the state is used to move water. All right, so physically it's a big issue. Um, culturally we've talked about it's important. The social monitor, how you, I mean, who gets access to it can be political, and obviously it's a scarce resource, so it's a price good as well. Um, if we look, I, I, th I think this makes more sense if you think about this in the context of the Romans, because the Romans really got it right. I mean, that system was in place for at least 800 years, and probably would have been in place much longer if barbarians didn't come over the walls. So how did they make it work? Well. They understood the physical aspect, right? Their engineering was brilliant. There was a social aspect with, with the locus. Um, it was priced as well. And then there's the politics of it also. Uh, if you read uh, sort of um, commentators and, and observers of what happened in Cochabamba, I think one of the things you, you draw from that is that they didn't understand that water has natures. So in Cochabamba, all they focused on was the priced aspect. Like how much are you going to charge? Uh, apparently, what got people in the street was not prices so much. People have been used to paying for, for their water. What got them in the street was a National Assembly decision to forbid the private collection of water. That completely changed the entitlements. Um, and it was basically enclosing what you might call the water commons. And that was very threatening. And people just didn't appreciate uh, how, much, um, how much impact that would have. Um, so a lot more to talk about. Uh, I apologize if this feels a, a bit like taking a sip out of a fire hose. Um, but it's a big, uh, I have to use that before. But it's a, uh, it's a big topic. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes, I guess, before folks need to leave for their classes. So I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions or try to answer questions. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Jim. It's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of, of uh, water as, a, as an affordable right which is to say that, you know, how much should it cost and to whom? Isn't that another way of saying it should be subsidized, which is not unlike what we do now here, right? So is that, is that, is that the model that you think is embedded in the, in the declaration there? You know, I don't, uh, I don't think they really, uh, I don't think there's a single, a single vision for this. I mean, there are a lot of ways you, you could do this, right? So for instance, in a few places in India, Essentially, what they have is a place uh, where they have taps that are open access, but they're very low flow. Um, so that gives you essentially access to water as well. Another city in India, they basically give out these um, these special uh, coins, they're not really coins, but tokens, that allow access to water as well. Um, the, 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 the subsidization also varies dramatically within the U.S. One of the, one of the aspects of the Safe Drinking Water Act that makes it quite controversial uh, is that you've got, you've got these national standards but for a number of the smaller drinking water suppliers, they can't afford to meet those standards. Right? So the arsenic, uh, the arsenic story is a huge, huge aspect of that. Um, and so, uh, I mean, subsidization clearly uh, can play a role. In many, in many countries, it does. 
But uh, the, I mean, even uh, even with subsidization, if you look at the, the, the sort of access to safe drinking water in the developing world, uh, it's it's a problem. Uh, and so, you know, one of the questions is, if we say yes, subsidization is the way to ensure affordability, where's the money going to come from? And that's the privatization argument in, 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 in some in some respects, right? They say, look, the, the the state sector, the public sector in many developing countries has not put the money up there, uh, and so the way to get the money, the, the only option is to privatize, because then we can bring the money in. Obviously, it's a simplistic uh, version of it, but that's essentially what the argument is. What the argument is. Yeah. But the other aspect of that is the question of sufficient yeah. and how that relates to affordability. There was an article in the Washington Post on Sunday mm -hmm. um, interviewing folks who live in gated communities in northern San Diego County. Yeah, the Rancho Santa Fe. Yeah. Yes, who were yeah. complaining bitterly that they were being told they weren't going to be able to water their lawns anymore. And their essential argument was, I can afford it, and if I want to water my lawn, there should be nobody telling me otherwise. Um, and their argument seems to be that, that if the price, you know, if you set the price high enough, then I can define what sufficient is. And otherwise, you've got the government essentially dictating kind of what is, you know, what is the allocation of water, which is socialism, and that we don't do that in this country. So right. how do you how do you decide what is a sufficient quantity for any particular? Right, well, I mean, there, there are two aspects. Of it. It's a fascinating story. Um, and, and one aspect is fascinating because it really it, it's a wonderful clash of individual rights versus communitarian rights and right. responsibilities. And in this community, there are no communitarian rights and responsibilities. Right? So that's more of a sort of political culture issue. Um, in terms of sufficiency, um, the government's got to step in. Right? I mean, this is one of the fears uh, of critics of privatization, which the argument is privatization is going to drive out, uh, drive out the poor because the price will go up and they can't afford it. The counter-argument to that is that the poor have always paid for their water. Um, you know, they have to. Right. Uh, and so the argument, so, so for example, where privatization, or at least I mean, the research I've read, one of the successful uh, uh, areas of privatization has been Buenos Aires. Uh, and in Buenos Aires, uh, there was a study that was done by researchers at Cal Berkeley. And what they found was that it was the poor who, was the mo who were the most supportive of privatization. Uh, and the wealthier were not, because the privatization essentially extended the infrastructure into the favelas and into the poor areas where they hadn't got the infrastructure before. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the, the, the question raises a lot, a, a lot of issues, and that's why, also why, you know, when people say they're for or against privatization, it's not a very meaningful statement because uh, there's so many different ways, so many different ways to do it. Yes? Uh, is there been much work done on the uh, impact of climate change on water quality? Yeah, some. I mean, in the, in, in the, um, there's sort of two, two issues that come up. One of them uh, is the, obviously if you get less water, you get higher concentrations of pollutants. And so you got more, so you get more, more, more difficult, so more, you got um, increasing difficult treatment, treatment issues. You've also got um, real, um, not just quality, real sort of availability issues. So Barcelona, which is about as modern a city as you'll find anywhere in the world, they actually had to import water from Marseille for a number of months uh, in tankers because they effectively ran out of water. Uh, for those of you who follow, actually, David, you probably know more about this than I do in Sao Paulo. Uh, I mean, they're facing, uh, I mean, I don't know if really the stories or not, but they're talking about how Sao Paulo may just run out of water. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, you know, people talk about will we run out of drinking water? And the answer is drinking water is the last thing we'll run out of if we run out of water because it's the highest, it's the highest value, right? Um, and so, you know, in, in Sao Paulo, they're going to have to do some serious reallocation uh, of, of who gets water. Um, now, you know, is that because of climate change? You know, obviously you can't say yes it is, but it certainly is considered <coughs> what we can expect uh, with climate change. Yeah. Um, uh, last time I looked, I was reading on this so-called public right to water <clears throat> conflict with the privatization agenda. One of the arguments I saw presented was that this was a false conflict because the, the water we need to satisfy the human right to, to water, in other words, to meet basic human needs, is really a very small amount. It's 25 so, liters per person per day. So, yeah. so we, can, we, can, uh, we can fulfill Maud uh, Barlow's agenda, and we, can, and we either can set aside the water that is needed to satisfy the human right to water, and then it's the, the lion's share of the water that's left, it's currently used for agricultural and industrial purposes, that badly needs to be commodified and subjected to a market discipline. 
and that as a practical matter, we can we can have our cake and eat it too. Right. There's th th that's that's both true and false. Right. Uh, it's true uh, quantitatively. It's false in terms of infrastructure. Right. So the challenge it depends where you are. Right. But the challenge in most places uh, is, is, is basically getting the infrastructure out to where people need the water. Right? So as, as, as a matter of quantity, what you're saying is right. I mean, the, uh, the amount of water that we consume in, in the household is, is a drip, you know, the drop. Um, it's like, I think, one or two percent compared to overall water consumption. But the challenge is how do you get it out there? Um, and part of what's going on as well, and this is a, a, as much an issue in, in, in developed world as it is in the developing world, is where we're getting our water from. So this is obviously this big push. Um, it used to be called toilet to tap. Um, that is not a, a great term <laughs> for this. Uh, Singapore calls it new water. Um, and uh, basically it's, it's taking water that goes into the water treatment plants and putting it back into the, uh, into the wastewater treatment plants and putting it back into the drinking water plants. And we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get there eventually. I mean, it's, you know, when, when folks ask me, you know, why is it that we use drinking water to water our lawns, it's because when the infrastructure was created, we could, right? I mean, so what we've done is we basically plumbed our, our sort of infrastructure on the assumption that we've got large quantities of clean water, that we'll be able to do it very cheaply. Um, so in, um, in Washington, D.C., uh, there are water mains that were laid just after the Civil War. Right. Around the United States, a water main is bursting every two minutes. Right. And this is no different than bridges and roads, uh, but it's more nefarious in some respects that you don't see it. Right. And so you talk to folks who, who basically work in the water industry, uh, both municipal and private, and they say they just cannot raise the funds to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, part of that is because it's a political process uh, to actually set the water rates. Um, so you know, the, the local politics is a big aspect of the story uh, as well. All right, well, I will, actually, it's a good timing, too. So thank you for your attention. Uh, it's not too early, but I've already